outside at school. I went out there and I waited for him. I had my fist barred up. He came out and I seen in his eyes a thing that every human being experiences. He had fear in his eyes. As we already talked about with fear, fear paralyzes you. It won't allow you to act. It will stifle you. It will choke you. It will keep you from going for what you want, which what he wanted was and to be feared by everybody else. So everything he wanted to show that he was, you know, special, and he was a karate fighter, all those things he couldn't do with fear. So, I got to beating him up. And I got to beating him up real good. And everybody was very surprised that I was doing so well in my battle against him. Because he was a formidable foe. He was a powerful enemy. He was put on a certain pedestal. He was looked at to be high and have a certain amount of power. And when I started to fight him, people said, well, he can be, he can be beaten. If not beaten, he at least can be fought. We don't have to take this from him. But it took one person to stand up. And it was because of what I felt, a personal thing. It was my personal dream. And Martin Luther King, being the wise man that he was, I know that he knew more than him was being affected by what was going on in the United States of America to the descendants and children of former slaves. I imagine that Morehouse had taught him a lot about politics and theology and so on and so forth. And the nuances of how human beings work and how we think as people. But at 10 or 9 years old, I didn't know that. All I knew was that I didn't like how I was being treated and I was going to stand up. And when I stood up, I became a symbol for standing up amongst my friends or my peers in my classroom. And it was my responsibility to stand up and change the things that I didn't like. But fear will have you think it's somebody else's fault. Fear will say, I don't really like him. But really, you do like that person. But fear makes you not like them because you feel like you won't be accepted. I say this all the time when I do business. You're good enough right now to start changing your life. Whatever happened yesterday, Whatever grades you got yesterday, whatever mishaps in your relationships you had, whatever bills you missed, whatever opportunities you missed to talk to somebody, that's the past. You got it right now. For a whole bunch of years, black folk as a whole had accepted a lot. We had one or two people that stood up, the famed Lou Hamers of the world, the Megan Evers, the Marcus Garvey's, the Frederick Douglasses. And there's a, and a myriad of different people we can name, you know, Nat Turner. But this is about Dr. Martin Luther King, who took all those struggles, all those dreams, and embodied it and, and, and internalized it. He became the dream. He walked and he talked the dream. Not of just him, but of so many other people that just wanted to be treated good. And when I fought Culver at 19 years old, 
and won the fight against somebody who everybody thought was a superhero. <laughs> he was like a superhero. Nobody could defeat him. Nobody could beat him. I didn't conquer Cobra, really. I didn't really conquer Cobra. He still came to school the next day, but what I had removed was fear. I battled fear. And I won. I had battled fear before. I didn't realize it. But I never got the power enough to actually act on it. And sadly, I went through it, but I still was like, nah. Them boys is too cool. They, they cuss all the time. I don't cuss, so I can't be cool as them. All them girls, they, they like the boys with the uh, white gym shoes. My gym shoes is kind of blue and old. That's how I And I think about all the little girls that COVID didn't talk to because they wasn't cute enough. They didn't think they was So if he didn't think they was cute, they didn't think they was cute. And they kind of just walked away and didn't talk to the other girl that COVID thought was cute. Because he said it was cute. People, don't fear, people fear to fear less. So... At 9 or 10 years old, I became fearless. And I took that with me through the rest of my life. People say, oh, Malik was tough, or he could fight better than that. He used to differ from Malik because he could fight better than everybody else. Only because I believe I can. Only because I believe if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back hard. So hard that you ain't going to hit me no more. That's what King did. Not physically. It was a nonviolent movement. Every time they hit him, he said, look what they're doing to us. We ain't did nothing. Because if you, in them day and age, they, they thought black folk was monsters and beasts. So if he got on TV and started beating up a bunch of white teenage boys, it would have been a problem. So he said, look at me. Look at my self-control. I'm in charge of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And if you want to be with me, this is how I'm going to conduct myself. And you got to be in charge of you. Rita Meacham. Um, Ruby Ware. All these unnamed people. Well, they got names, but we ain't no church secretaries and grandmothers. And six-year-old little girls. Like my friend Kanye West, his mom. Six years old. At a city. They wouldn't serve black folks if she sat there six years old. Now some of us didn't start at six, but you can start right now. And if you look at the world through the eyes of the fearless, everybody's your companion. He said, sit together at the table of brotherhood. You're talking about folk that then killed black people, hung them on trees took their freedom, took their money. He said, we could all sit together at the table of brotherhood. That made them afraid right there. Like, why he ain't afraid of us? He want to sit down. We, they can understand if he's like, come on, get guns and shoot. They would understood that. Because they got way more guns than us. They make the guns. It's been the Western, they white folks. The man that made the Ruger, he white. They can understand that language. They ready for that. They're not ready for you to say, I'm going to sit down with you. Because he was fearless. And people fear the fearless. Now, all this ain't going to register with you today. It took me quite some time to get all these concepts together. It took me two plane rides back and forth across the Pacific Ocean to come up with this. This right here. Put these concepts together. But when you look at Martin Luther King, he says his dream. That's not so far-fetched. We make it a really big deal because he did something that was not being done in that day and age and that time. But somebody put this together. Fear won't let you 
building thing. Or let you complete me. If you gotta go get beat down, you gotta get beat down. But you gotta stand for what you know is right. For what you know is right. You gotta stand up for it. For the little people. And sometimes we ourselves is the little people. Sometimes we are the little people. You gotta stand up for the little people though. I, from a personal standpoint, that's what we kind of talking about, is the personal journey. I was scared to fail in school. I was scared to turn in my homework because the teacher might laugh at my handwriting. I was scared. When I was 18, I had a girl I liked a whole lot. Because of my lifestyle, because of what I was doing, and because my name was kind of bad on the street that, you know, Malik is bad and you know, he's fighting all the time and he in a gang and all that stuff. So my fear said, you can't be with that girl because she's not going to like you. At the time, in America, there was a very big push, which was a good thing for black men that went to college and had jobs and so on and so forth. And I wasn't that guy. And everybody was bragging. They had a, group, a rap group called the College Boys. You remember that, Brandon? Mm -hmm. Everybody was talking about colleges and the black college thing. Do the right thing was out. And the Cosby Show had the spin off of Different, Different World. It was all about college and everything. And that was a positive thing. Very positive movie. They had the uh, college clothing line out, the Morehouse stuff. Everybody was at Hampton. It was, you know, everything, all that whole college lifestyle experience was very big. And people wanted that. So what I had to offer was different. It was genuine. It was authentic. It was really me. But it was way different. So here come fear again. I knew that I liked her. I knew that she was special, she was sweet, and she was kind. But I knew that I wasn't who she wanted. Now, I was faced with a very big decision. How do I change myself? You know, go back to school, get your diploma, first thing. Then get enrolled in the college, leave the streets along the league. Start your business. All the things I wanted to do, mixed with the things I needed to do, was in my brain. But the fear of inadequacy, I wasn't smart enough. And I wasn't smart enough to sit down and get my GED. I wasn't smart enough. I was afraid. And if I left the streets and my friends and my family, who I thought were my friends and family, how would I be accepted by this new group of people that's in college and very well spoken and with experiences of, of life that they parents were talking about? My father's a construction worker. My mama was a stay-at-home mom. People were professionals. So, eight years later, nine years later, fear came back. So I turned my back. And with another direction. Because fear won't let you get what you want. Can we say that already? It won't let you get what you love, and it definitely won't let you get what you need. What you need. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, where there's inadequacy, God will make a surplus. If you believe, in yourself and God. It's not about a religion because Mahatma Gandhi, you know, he was a Hindu. Malcolm X was a Muslim. So Arthur was a Buddhist. Martin Luther King was a Christian. They all had the same concept that was a power bigger than all of us. It's so big, it can't even fit into your body. You got to fit into it. 